Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a representative of an insurance company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello? Motor Insurance Department? Oh, hello. I'd like to ask about insurance for my car. Yes, of course. I'll just take a few details. What's your name? Patrick Jones. The customer's name is The customer's name is Patrick Jones. So Patrick Jones has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello? Motor Insurance Department? Oh, hello. I'd like to ask about insurance for my car. Yes, of course. I'll just take a few details. What's your name? Patrick Jones. And your address? It's 27 Bank Road. 27 Bank Road. Is that in Greendale? Yes. And what's your daytime phone number? My work number is 730... Four five three. And could I ask what your occupation is? Dentist. OK. Now, a few details about your car. What size is the engine? It's 1,200 cc's. Thank you. And the make and model? It's a Hewton Sable. Could you spell the model name, please? Yes. S-A-B-L-E. Oh, yes. Uh, thanks. And when was it made? 1997. Lovely. Right. I presume you've had a previous insurer? Yes. Right. We need to know the name of the company. Yes. It was uh, Northern Star. Thank you. And uh, have you made any insurance claims in the last five years? Yes. Uh, one in 1999. And what was the problem? It was stolen, but... That's fine, Mr Jones. That's all we need to know at the moment. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And will there be any other named drivers? Just the one. And his name? Simon Painter. Could you spell the surname, please? P-A-Y-N-T-E-R. OK, thank you. And what relationship is he to you? He's my brother-in-law. And what will you or Mr Painter be using the car for? Well, um, mainly for social use. Social use. Will you be using it to travel to work? Yes, sometimes. Travel to work? Anything else? No, that's it. And finally, 
When would you like to start the insurance? I'll need it from the 31st of January. Right. Mr Jones, I'm getting a couple of quotes coming up on the computer now, and the best bit looks like being with a company called Red Flag. Yeah? And that comes out at uh, $450 per year. Oh, well... That seems OK. It's quite a bit lower than I've been paying up to, up to now. Great. So, would you like me to go ahead with that? Sure. Why not? How would you like to pay? That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a coordinator for the annual ski and snowboard exhibition talking to the audience about some practical information for the whole event. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone and welcome to the annual ski and snowboard exhibition held from April the 8th to 17th. I am Mary Granger, coordinator of the event this year. The 10-day event features many highlights. As a snow sports lover, I know you are looking forward to a great time here. Now, I'd like to offer you some practical information about the whole event and what to expect from it. This might be the first time coming here for some of you, so for those who are still wondering about the right accommodation, I recommend Sky Hotel. It has its own health and sports clubs, just like most of the hotels here, but I love it because of its incredibly cosy beds, which guarantees good rest after an exhausting day of exploration. If you haven't brought your own equipment, like poles, boots and skis, they are available for purchase or rent at Ski Set or Snow Rental. The exhibition this year provides a colourful look into the history of skiing and an inspiring peek into the future prospects of the sport. Apart from the fascinating photo exhibitions and the most up-to-date skiing gear like always, this year we have added four computers which can imitate the process of skiing, ensuring the same physical activity and sensations that appear during the skiing process on downhill slopes. But I have to warn you that it might be quite time-consuming to line up for the free trial experience. Many have posed the question as to how to enter the skiing and snowboarding competition. Well, rather than filling out the back of the entrance ticket or bombarding the committee with emails, the most effective method is by checking out the exhibition newsletter delivered every month for availability. At the most beloved local event, the exhibition has also drawn attention from the press. Last year, massive media coverage was on the worrisome amount of snowfalls. In order to avoid the same predicament, several artificial skiing slopes have been built. With more participants this year, we have lowered the entrance fee, which has been widely reported to local newspapers. A bonus for our participants is the ski programme. It offers a wide variety of lessons and sessions with qualified instructors, ensuring that all ages and abilities are catered to from the first timers to seasoned amateurs. I strongly advise you to sign up for the programme as it is offering an unprecedented 30% discount. 
That's mainly because we are cooperating with the programme organiser who promises affordable prices only for the participants of the festival this year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, I would like to introduce you to the list of presentations during the following week so that you can better plan your schedule. The first presenter, Simon, is one of our best ski instructors. As an experienced instructor, he will inform you about the dangers that face skiers and snowboarders. Accidents happen mostly to those who are careless or ignorant. Good risk management involves considering both the probability and consequences of an accident. The next speech, titled Solution, is given by Jamie Kurt. A list of problems may occur to novice skiers and snowboarders, so he is going to offer useful information for first-timers on choosing the appropriate gears, the right dress code and ways of protecting your skin. For instance, some of you may have rented the skiing equipment, but rental footwear is notoriously uncomfortable. Then, Jamie will provide instructions to help make your footwear fit better. The third speech is about a documentary introducing skiing and snowboarding and the difference between the two sports. It also depicts a group of snow lovers exploring new slopes with breathtaking views. The director, Andy Fisher, will be there, addressing the whole shooting experience. The fourth talk is about the tricks of skiing, presented by Harry Tyson. It is most useful for those who have already tried skiing, yet still need more practice to master the sport. Harry will teach you how to turn more skillfully. A lot of people can keep their skis roughly parallel, but there's no point if you make it hard to work with and slide around out of control. Useful exercises will also be suggested to improve your parallel skiing technique so that you can tackle steeper slopes and enjoy yourself more. Jason Smith will be the last presenter, mainly addressing towards advanced skiers. He manages to apply snow climbing into skiing. Climbing in soft snow, you are floundering around. Walking becomes harder, so a good trick during climbing is to maintain a wider gait, approximately shoulder width, so that you are more stable while walking. This works for skiing as well. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a conversation about tea between an expert and a reporter. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 24. Hi Jacob, thank you so much for coming along today. It's my pleasure. I'm very intrigued about what a tea meditation entails exactly. Well, it's very simple really. I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that it is mostly about leaving everything that you have been thinking or worrying about today to one side. Really focus on the present moment. Oh, it sounds great. I certainly don't know very much about tea and I'm keen to get started. But before you go into more detail, can I ask you what your favourite kind of tea is? Well, 
I think the kind of tea we are going to have today is my favourite. It is pu'er tea from Yunnan province in southern China. What makes this tea special? Pu'er is a dark tea. The regions of Yunnan, the north of Vietnam and Laos, have one of the best climates for growing tea in the world. Pu'er is a post-fermented tea. Oh, uh, what is a post-fermented tea exactly? It is a tea that has undergone a period of ageing in the open air. They age the tea for days, even years. The exposure to humidity and oxygen help to oxidise the tea leaves and encourage fermentation. This changes the smell of the tea and also removes a lot of bitterness from the taste. It sounds similar to the process of ageing wine. The process is different, but the effect of ageing on the taste is certainly similar. Does this mean the tea can be quite expensive? Absolutely. It can be very expensive. The tea is usually pressed into balls or cakes and sold. At one time, only tea enthusiasts cared about buying these cakes, but now many people have realised that they are an investment, and so buy them like they would buy gold, because the price goes up a lot over time. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 25 to 26. So now I want you to focus on clearing your mind of anything other than this present moment. Let go of any concerns. OK, uh, one slight problem. I will need to record our conversation and I will need to take notes for the article. I plan to write about this for my newspaper. Is that OK? Oh yes, of course. Whatever you need. Thank you. I'll try to keep my notes to a minimum. Good. So where was I? Oh yes, I think very few people really appreciate the complexity and variety of tea that exists in the world. Right, most people are maybe like me and just use tea bags. Exactly, and with a tea bag, the tea is trapped inside and cannot move around freely. You can really taste the difference drinking a brewed tea that was free to move around through all the water. So, do you ever use tea bags? Never. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 27 to 30. There are many different kinds of tea. White, yellow, black, green, oolong, matcha, herbal and many others. Each one has its own unique properties. To fully experience what each tea has to offer, you must brew it in the correct way. I also believe in only drinking tea that is picked and sorted by hand, rather than using mechanical processes. Although it takes more time, the tea made by hand is so much better that it leads to an increase in the tea sales. But in that case, surely if there is more interest in the tea, and with the time-intensive farming process, this means there could be shortages because the demand is higher than the ability to produce it. There were shortages for a while, but then an artificial fermentation process was developed in the 1970s which helped to speed up the fermentation times. As I mentioned, this process has an ageing effect on the taste of pu'er tea that is very similar to the effect on the taste of wine that you get from that fermentation process, though for pu'er tea today we are talking about that artificial process. How can they do this artificially? The farmers gather the tea leaves into a big pile, then cover it with a large sheet or tarp. They spray water on the tea every now and then, and therefore fermentation happens faster. 
Usually, the tea is left for 30, 45, 60 or even 90 days still. The farmer will check the tea every few days and just by the feel of the tea, he knows whether it is ready or if it needs more time. Wow, that sounds like a fascinating process. I never realised that there was such a science behind producing tea. Well, now you are ready for the best part, the tasting of it. That sounds like a very good idea to me. So what I will do now is boil the water and we can begin our meditation. What does that entail? We need to focus on only two things. The first is your mind and body. Forget everything that you have been worrying about today. Forget about what you have to do later on or what somebody said to you earlier. Focus on your breathing and on how your body feels. If you have aches and pains, acknowledge them. Pinpoint where there is tension in your body and try to release it. Oh yes, I can really feel tension in my shoulders. Let it go. Close your eyes if that helps. Take deep breaths in and out. Soon we will drink the tea. When you drink it, think about the taste and how it feels on your tongue. Is it easy to swallow the tea or do you need to gulp it? Can you brew the tea leaves more than once? Oh yes, you can brew some teas more than ten times. Now we will shift to noble silence, focusing only on ourselves and the tea. Enjoy. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a talk on cat breeds. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Look at her, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't she beautiful? The Abyssinian is a natural breed of cat which originated in Africa, or more specifically, what is now Ethiopia. Today it is found in much of the surrounding African continent, particularly Somalia. Its head is broad and moderately wedge-shaped, and it has relatively large pointed ears, like the specimen you can see here in front of you. It is typically a reddish colour and is known for the unusual M-shaped marking which often appears directly above the two eyes. See here. It has a medium length coat in a sort of ticked pattern, ticked being a term to describe when the hair gets progressively darker from root to tip. There you go little fellow, well done. Now this gentleman, he is a male I can assure you, is the Aegean. The Aegean is of Greek origin as you might have guessed and is thought to have come from the Cycladic Islands. It's considered to be the only native Greek breed of cats. It is one of the newest and therefore rarest cat breeds, but relatively plentiful throughout Greece. It is much liked for its intelligence and friendliness and because it excels in pest control. 
It has a semi-long-haired coat with rich tail. The coat is typically bi or tricolored, with white always present, and the other colors ranging from black to red, blue cream, etc. These colors are just as likely to present themselves as stripes. This little guy, as you can see, has beautiful reddish blue stripes running through a pale coat. The head is medium sized and quite round. The ears have a wide base, rounded tips, and are covered by hairs. Now the Australian. Australians are still mainly confined to distribution in their homeland. Obviously Australia, though a number of catteries in the UK have started to breed them too. Look at those expressive eyes. The cat is a fine example of the breed, medium sized and short haired. Notice also the large round head. This breed is much loved for its tolerance of children and because it is very rarely inclined to scratch. Its coat is typically spotted or, as in the case of this little fellow, classic tabby style. Last but not least, we have the bobtail, another relatively new breed, like the Aegean and Australian. The bobtail first appeared in the 1960s in the United States, the only country in which it has a significant distribution, and is most notable for its stubby bobbed tail, which is only something like one-third to one-half the length of a normal cat's tail. It is a very sturdy breed, with rather shaggy and dense fur. Bobtails can have any colour fur, and often have the appearance of a tabby. Unlike the other breeds we have discussed, the bobtail is not natural. It is said to be a result of the crossbreeding of a domestic tabby cat and a bobcat. Such is the careful breeding the cat has undergone that it comes in all colours. And there are also both long and short hair versions. If I had to recommend one of these breeds to you today, I would have to vouch for the Australian. After all, as all of us here are parents, we must surely agree that our children are our first consideration when it comes to purchasing a pet. What effect the animal will have on them? How will it react? Etc. These are questions we all ask ourselves. And they are even more important when the child is very young. The Australian is simply unrivaled in the temperament department and is extremely unlikely to lose its composure and take a swipe at your child. That said, it is still a very rare breed in these parts. And as with all things in the world, rare equates to very expensive. So it may be beyond the price range some of you are prepared to pay. Surprisingly, perhaps, though the bobtail is part lynx or bobcat, as they say in the States, it doesn't appear to have inherited any of the wildcat's aggressiveness. And therefore, it makes an excellent second best as a pet you can allow to be around children. It is also considerably less expensive. The other two breeds we have talked about both make excellent house pets. However, hand on heart, I could not endorse either as a pet to have around young children. In my view, the child's safety is not something to gamble with. So, if you can afford the extra few quid to lay out for a bobtail, or better still, an Australian, do so. You won't regret it. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Oh, <laughs> one.